Dr. Tony Weiss Corre. Ni hao and good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to be here today. I'd like to see a show of hand for anybody who has ever had trouble finding their car in a busy parking lot. Yes. When we get older, it becomes difficult to sometimes remember things like, where did you park your car? Now, when you're young, you don't have any problems with that. If I ask the same question to my students, they don't know what we're talking about. Our brain has this remarkable capacity to store information, to store information such as where you parked your car, and it uses spatial information, such as a lamppost or a storefront, to make what we call a spatial map. We can then retrieve this map again, and if you're young, you may drive your car into this parking lot, you talk to your friends, maybe the music is on, you go shopping for three hours, you come back and you know exactly where your car is. But as you get older, it becomes more difficult to make these maps and to retrieve them. Now, we don't know exactly why this is, but we know actually animals, including monkeys, dogs, and even mice, as you will see later, have the same problems. So we, know, we don't know exactly what happens with this young supercomputer brain that we are uh, growing up with. As we get older, it becomes less efficient. We know that the connections between nerve cells, what we call synapses, they start to degenerate and disappear. The nerve cells themselves degenerate and they disappear, and even the brain itself shrinks as we get older. The brain becomes more susceptible to neurodegeneration and diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. So wouldn't it be great if we could slow down this process or even reverse it? In Western culture, there's this mythology about the fountain of youth or that magic water that you can drink or bathe in it, you enter this fountain and you re-emerge young and rejuvenated on the other side. In Chinese tradition, there is Xu Fu, who was sent um, in ancient China by Qin Huang to try to find the elixir of life that would make the emperor live forever. On the first trip, he returned and he didn't find it. He went to a second trip and he never returned. So we don't know if he found it and maybe he still lives, but most likely he did not find it. But what I want to share with you today is a remarkable breakthrough that in animal research that suggests that at least in mice, there may be something magical such as a fountain of youth. And this is around an animal model where we surgically connect two mice of different ages. This is called parabiosis, and it's similar to um, Siamese twins that are born sometimes, where they are uh, born together and they share a circulation, a blood circulation. So in this case, the circulation from a young and an old mouse are combined. And Tom Rando, together with Irv Weissman and Irina Conboy, when she was in his lab at Stanford University, were the first to actually use this in modern time to ask the very specific question whether an old muscle, if it's injured, can be regenerated if it's exposed to factors from a young environment. So the question was, if you injure an old muscle, it cannot usually regenerate, but it makes only scar tissue. So he, Tom asked the question, is this because there is something missing in the, the muscle itself, or is there a factor from outside that is missing? And when he paired an old mouse with a young mouse, he could actually show that there are factors in this young mouse that can make the old muscle regenerate almost like a young one. So some factors seem to be present that can regenerate or rejuvenate this old muscle. He also saw effects in the liver, 
And he had some indication that maybe even the brain would benefit from this. Others have seen effects on the heart, pancreas, and so forth. We're more than a dozen labs who have seen similar effects on multiple organs. And my lab, working together with Tom Rando, was able to show that this may also be true for the brain, that the brain actually benefits from being exposed to a young environment. And I'm going to show you a bit more data about that. At the heart of this whole idea is the blood. The blood is the tissue that connects all the different organs in our body. So if you exercise, for example, we know that this benefits the brain. There's factors that are produced in the muscle that the blood transports to the brain. The blood, of course, also contains cells, but the liquid part of the blood, we call plasma, is what contains a lot of different molecules and factors. So we can then ask, what happens to the blood when it is in a young person or in an old person, when it's in a young mouse or an old mouse? Does the blood actually age itself? Does the blood show changes with age? And to do that, we look at very specific factors in the blood that are part in the liquid phase, the, the plasma, that cells use to talk to each other. Like I talk to you now with words, cells in our body can talk to each other with proteins. So a cell one can secrete a protein, it can release it into the space outside, and another cell can then receive this signal with its ears, which is called receptors. And so this cell can then do different things. It can, for example, be a signal that says, everything is fine, just keep doing what you're doing. It's a survival signal. And there's lots of signals like that. They're, they're produced by growth factors. It can tell it to make a new copy of it because something needs to grow, like the muscle needs to grow when you exercise. It can be to make a more complicated cell, or it can be a signal to kill the cell because you don't need it anymore. And some examples of these factors are growth hormone, interferons, or insulin. But they're not just three words. There are thousands of words, and we understand very few of them. So we did a number of experiments over the past 10 years or so to try to understand this better. And I want to give you an example of how we do this. So we took 400 blood samples from healthy people aged 20 to over 100. And then we measured over 1,000 proteins that are these words in this language of cells, proteins that the cells use to talk to each other. With the idea that we can see whether they change with age, but also whether we can find a signature of aging, something that describes aging itself. And to our surprise, what we found is that actually a third of all of them change between a young person and an old person. So this suggests that the language these cells use in our body changes significantly as we get older. And moreover, you can use just a few of these measurements, a few proteins that tell you more or less how old a mouse is or how old a person is. And this is how this looks. So here we look in an experiment that we did a number of years ago um, at people from 20 to 100 years of age, and you can see on the uh, horizontal axis the chronological age, the actual age of a person. And then we take the top factors that change with age, and we calculate for each person the relative age. We call this a biological age, or the predicted age of a person. Now, if we predicted age perfectly, everybody would be on this 45 degree line. But that would not be interesting, right? Because then we would just have another clock. We would be able to tell you how old you are, but you, you know that already. We, what we want to know is, if you are younger or older than you actually are. And we all know people who seem to look younger or feel younger, be younger or older than what they are. And so an example here is this person who is 70 years of age, but looks biologically only like a 45-year-old person. So is this a person who will live maybe to 100 years, who will not have age-related diseases such as diabetes, arthritis, 
or Alzheimer's disease? Is this a person who is just healthier? On the other hand, this individual here with the red dot is not even 40, but when we measure their proteins, their aging proteins, this person looks like a 65-year-old person. So is this a person who is at risk to develop a nature-related disease and maybe will not live as long? This is, at this point, is still um, research that we're doing. We don't know exactly if we're looking at the right factors, if this is really aging. But we're extremely interested and excited about the possibilities, because if you knew this, you could treat a person before they actually have a disease. You could ask them, maybe, or try to encourage them to live healthier, to maybe exercise, eat better food, stop smoking, if they have an older signature than what they actually are. So, what I showed you this far is all correlation, right? I showed you a lot of changes that happen in the blood with age, that correlate with age. But you don't know if they actually have something to do with age. Like, the shoe size usually correlates with how tall you are. But if you wear larger shoes, you don't grow. That's a correlation. So what we want to know is if these factors can actually change aging, can they modulate aging? And to do this, we use again this model, parabiosis, what we actually found out. We don't need to suture these mice together. We can simply take the blood, the plasma from a young mouse and inject it repeatedly into an old mouse. And what we find is that the old mouse, their brain has more stem cells, it makes more nerve cells in the brain, it has more activity, it has more electrical activity, and has less inflammation. So what are the functional consequences? You care, of course, about function. Does this affect the memory in these mice? So what we use here is sort of a parking lot test for mice. It looks a little bit different than the one I showed you at the very beginning, but here basically the mouse is on a big table. There's a bright light shining on it, like here, and the mouse is scared. It wants to escape. And we teach it over four days, four times a day, to find the single hole pointed at with the red arrow where they can escape into a tube where it's dark and comfortable for the mouse. And so what I show you now is an old mouse that um, got salt solution injected over three weeks. And you see that this old mouse is trying to find the hole with the arrow. And it uses the spatial cues. Like I told you, we humans use a lamppost, maybe a storefront. The mouse here uses the checkerboard, the triangle, the rectangle, but you can see this mouse cannot remember where the hole is. The next mouse you see is the same age, but it was injected with young plasma. Over three weeks, every three days, we gave it a very small injection, IV, uh, into, the, into the blood. Uh, and what you can see is that this mouse has a different strategy. It doesn't just start walking. It's almost like it looks around first. Where am I? This is the best mouse we ever had. Now, when you look at the data, um, what you see is these old mice, um, we rescue them actually after 90 seconds. You see how long does it take them. If they don't find it in 90 seconds, we take them away. And you can see over four days, four trials, this mouse doesn't learn anything. But the mouse that, um, and we use many different mice, and this is just one of many experiments that we did, um, you can see on the fourth day, they really start to learn this test, and they can remember again where that uh, where that escape hole is. So what this suggests is there is something in young blood, in the young plasma fraction, actually both in young mouse blood and in young human blood, that can activate the brain's function again, so that it functions more like a younger brain. Because people get plasma all the time in hospitals, this is relative safe. My colleague 
uh, clinicians who see patients with Alzheimer's disease said, why don't you try this in humans? Plasma is probably is, is very safe treatment, so you could test it directly in patients. And so we started a company, Alkahest, and um, did a first proof of concept study um, where we treated 18 patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. We gave them once a week, we gave them a unit of plasma, that's 250 milliliters, and then we tested safety. This is the primary purpose of this test, uh, of this study. It's a phase one study, is to see is it safe. Um, and then we also looked at daily activities of living and so forth. And the results were just actually yesterday, they were announced in Boston. So we clearly see um, no adverse effect. This is a safe treatment, at least in this small study. And interestingly, many, uh, several of the patients actually showed an improvement in their function. So for example, buttoning your shirt or brushing teeth or checking your uh, finances. These are what we call daily activities of living. So they, they showed significant improvements in these. Now, I have to say that we have to be very careful because these are only 18 patients. So it's possible that when we look at more people, we will not see the same effect. So, but the next step is clearly to test this in a larger number of people. We go to a phase two trial. What we will also do is um, actually use a fraction of plasma that we already found is more potent than the whole thing. So this is what we move forward with. But clearly, there will not be enough plasma. There will not be enough blood to treat millions of people with Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. So we have to understand what are the factors in the blood that are responsible for this? So what we want to do is the Brain Rejuvenation Project, an initiative where, first of all, we want to understand all these signals that cells use to talk to each other. We want to find the, and decipher this language of cells and want to do that both in humans as well as in mice. We also want to understand the genes that are involved in making old brains function better again. What are the genes that are mediating these effects? So that we can identify key proteins and genes. We have already identified a few and we described these uh, in, the, in, the, in the past few years. But we don't know if these are the most important ones and if these are the best ones to move forward to people. So we want to test these key factors and genes in mice, we also use a new model, a fish that lives only five months, so we can quickly change different genes and see is it living longer and healthier. And then we will go with these new, uh, new treatments into human patients, into clinical studies, so that we hopefully find treatments that can help people uh, avoid age-related diseases, most importantly, Alzheimer's disease and other uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Thank you very much.